After enduring for thousands of years on every inhabited continent, the institution of slavery was obliterated throughout the Western Hemisphere in a period of little more than half a century. Brazil was the last nation in the Hemisphere to abolish slavery in 1888, a quarter of a century after Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation in the United States, and just over half a century after slavery was abolished in the British colonies. Remarkable as the abolition of slavery was, its social consequences were not so readily abolished, and in fact endured for generations. While the Civil War ended the legal distinction between slave and free people of African ancestry in the United States, it did not end these internal social divisions. Color stratification, in fact, tended to become more rigid now that vast numbers of newly emancipated blacks demographically swamped the free persons of color who were determined not to be swamped socially as well. New Orleans, with its Caribbean cultural heritage, was and remained the most extreme example of internal social stratification by color, but internal social exclusiveness based on skin color also remained important among Negroes in Chicago at least as late as the 1940s and in Washington, D.C., even after World War II. Both conservative apologists and radical critics of Western civilization have attempted to make the case that the institution of slavery made an important contribution to the economic and cultural development of the West. It has been claimed, for example, that the slavery of ancient times made possible the classical culture of Greece and Rome. However, it would be extremely difficult to sustain such a case for the slavery of the past five centuries, for which evidence is more abundant. No nation in the Western Hemisphere, and perhaps no nation anywhere in history, so prodigally consumed so many millions of slaves as Brazil. Yet, when Brazil became the last nation in the hemisphere to abolish the institution of slavery in 1888, it was still an economically underdeveloped country. Its later industrial and commercial development was largely the work of European immigrants, who accomplished a more general and enduring transformation of the Brazilian economy within two generations than it occurred during centuries of slavery. The most economically developed parts of Brazil, indeed the industrial heartland of all Latin America, are precisely those areas in the southern regions of the country settled by immigrants from Germany, Italy, and Japan. Even in the late twentieth century, the less developed northeastern region of Brazil continued to have a non-white majority, while the more developed and more prosperous regions continued to have a white majority. Similarly in the United States, the regions where slavery was most heavily concentrated tended to be the most economically backward regions, whose white populations seldom had as high incomes as in states where slavery had never been a major institution. In Europe, it was the nations in the western region of the continent, where slavery was abolished first, that led the continent and the world into the modern industrial age. Racial oppression was another legacy of western society and of slavery. The Islamic countries were never as racist as the Western world, though they became more racist than before, after their large-scale importation of African slaves. Among Western Hemisphere nations, racial oppression was at its worst in the United States, especially in the former slave states of the South. Lynchings of Negroes peaked at 161 per year in 1892 in the United States, while this phenomenon remained unknown in Latin America and the Caribbean. Brazil, in particular, has long been noted for more relaxed race relations than the United States, and, despite later revisions of Brazil's image as a country completely free of racism, it clearly has had far less racial oppression than the United States. This makes all the more striking the fact that Brazil has had larger black-white disparities in education than the United States, and Brazilians of African descent showed less upward mobility than Americans of African descent. As of 1976, the average income of mulattoes in Brazil was approximately half of white income, and that of blacks barely more than one-third. By contrast, the Negro or African-American average income in the United States was more than half that of white Americans decades earlier. As of the same year, 1976, black men in the United States were earning three-fifths of the income of white men while black women were earning 91% of the income of white women. Clearly, this was the opposite of what would be expected on the assumption that racial discrimination is the crucial factor in economic progress. 
However, this apparent anomaly is much more readily understandable in terms of human capital differences between the African origin populations of the two countries. American Negroes, being predominantly native-born even in colonial times, became the most culturally Europeanized of all African origin populations in the world, and the most prosperous. The contrast between blacks in Haiti and those in the United States makes the same point even more sharply. Haitian blacks, having been independent of whites for more than two centuries, should be the most prosperous in the hemisphere, and American blacks the poorest, if racial oppression accounts for poverty. But in fact, their respective economic positions are directly the reverse, again suggesting that human capital has a greater effect than racial oppression. The advantages of those Africans who acquired European cultures are demonstrable in many other ways as well. Even during the era of slavery, blacks who returned to Africa from Brazil were more in demand than Africans reared in the indigenous culture, and their descendants continued to be prominent among the African elite in Nigeria, for example. American Negroes who settled in Liberia in the early 19th century maintained an ascendancy and even a despotic rule over indigenous Africans for more than a century, until overthrown in a coup in 1980. Among indigenous Africans in Africa, those more in contact with Europeans, whether in ports, capital cities, or missionary schools, advanced economically much more rapidly than their compatriots in the remote countryside, not only during the period of European colonialism, but also long afterward, in the era of independence. Most of the leaders of the newly independent African nations were men educated in Europe or the United States, and thoroughly westernized. Even when they promoted pan-Africanism, for example, they were promoting a kind of thinking found in Europe, like pan-Slavism or pan-Germanism, but wholly foreign to the indigenous cultures of Africa, with their heavy emphasis on community, family, and tribal ties. Because Africans in the Western Hemisphere diaspora were introduced to European culture through the institution of slavery, it is difficult to disentangle the effects of slavery from the effects of European culture itself. Most Africans enslaved in the Western Hemisphere were introduced only to the lowest levels of European culture, only what they needed to know to function as plantation field hands. Indeed, laws and practices throughout the Hemisphere attempted to prevent their acquiring such rudiments of Western civilization as the ability to read and write, much less such higher values as concepts of human freedom and dignity. Nevertheless, by one means or another, Africans in the Western Hemisphere began the long and slow ascent toward the higher levels of European culture on their own. By the middle of the nineteenth century, most free persons of color in the United States could read and write, and, half a century after emancipation, so could more than half the entire Negro population of the country. This has been called an accomplishment seldom witnessed in human history. The peoples of Yugoslavia, for example, achieved 52% literacy only in the 1920s, and four-fifths of Albanians were still illiterate at that time. India, near the end of the 20th century, had yet to reach the level of literacy achieved by black Americans at its beginning. Although continuing black-white differences in income, occupations, and other social indicators have been widely attributed to racial discrimination, the experience of black immigrants from the Caribbean in the same society undermines this explanation. As of 1990, the median household incomes of immigrants from Jamaica, Barbados, Trinidad, and Tobago all equaled or exceeded that of Americans in general. Selective migration may well have led to an atypical sample of the people of these societies living in the United States. However, the point here is not to compare the blacks of the Caribbean with blacks in the United States but to compare the theory that racial differences in income are due to discrimination with factual data.